I know many of you have uh, seen me talk about these topics before. So if you're hearing things that you've heard a million times and you're sort of like, okay, that's enough. Um, I won't be offended if you, <laughs> if you want to take off. Um, I'm, I am pretty often pretty thorough with my slides and I always put them up on uh, our academic integrity SharePoint page. So I'll make sure that you have the link to that. Um, it's a, it's an internal resource only. So you have to log in to access it. Um, and it's where uh, we can update things really quickly. So I'll put it in the chat so that you have it. Um, I've recently published some guidelines from my office about uh, generative AI tools and academic integrity for the fall semester. So you can check that out if you have any questions or if there are any resources you wanna see on that page, um, please do let me know. My email address is athomas at american.edu. Um, I'm gonna share my slides um, so that uh, we can kind of get started with this presentation and jump in uh, in the chat. Uh, and I'll give you uh, time to ask questions or uh, redirect the conversation um, as we as we go along. I'm just gonna take a second to share my screen. Great. So the new wisdom of AI power. This is the session is sort of about the Purdue Owl, but really it's about the changing landscape of popular generative AI tools and kind of how we as a community. Uh, respond to all those changes. Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel pretty overwhelmed by how fast the technology landscape is changing. I feel like I have to know everything about every tool all, all the time. Um, and so that's really gotten me thinking about uh, some of the ways I can uh, generalize about those tools, some of the ways I can return to some of the roots of good teaching that I think are really at the heart of the strategies that at least that I'm advising, but that I've heard um, the people that I trust in the academic integrity um, uh, uh, sort of culture to, to help um, figure out. So my email address, like I said, is athomas at american.edu. Um, I lead the Office of Academic Integrity. I consider the topic of this presentation to be academic integrity related. Um, but if you have specific questions about something you've seen in a class or something you're worried about in terms of students running afoul of the academic integrity code, like misuse of generative AI tools, um, I may ask you to email me about that separately or um, talk about that um, privately just so that um, I can kind of focus on what's here um, uh, in this presentation. And then obviously I wanna address other concerns you have. Um, so I may ask you to email me about separate things. Um, our description uh, that you've seen um, references not only the Purdue OWL, but uh, Grammarly, which is a really popular tool for, for students, for staff, for faculty um, and, and the, the concept of help. Uh, there's a lot of help resources and I use help in quotation marks um, to really draw attention to the fact that there's a lot of stuff that calls itself help um, that we may not all agree is helpful. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think is important about uh, this session. Um, so we'll talk about some of those help tools. We'll try to identify um, some of the features of, of some of the popular uh, AI powered help tools. Um, and think about how we can articulate some guidance that's appropriate. Um, so I mentioned the first problem already. Um, yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, we're not gonna we're not gonna solve any of them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, these tools are constantly changing. Uh, we have a lot of vocabularies for talking about AI, uh, AI generative AI, large language learning models, um, uh, chatbots. There's there's a lot of different vocabulary. All those terms don't necessarily mean the same thing. Um, I'm not really a, the expert in position to give you um, a, um, a tutorial on, on generative AI. And so I won't wade too far into those waters except in their, in their relationship to some of the tools that we'll, that we'll look at. Um, I think it's also worth recognizing that faculty and students alike, staff, um, those who support our students across campus, um, we may not all have the tools we need to navigate um, this ecosystem. Um, so I mentioned this, and uh, of course, this always brings to mind a movie that many of my students have not seen, but I've watched a million times, Princess Bride. Um, but it reminds us that uh, 
the word help is really complicated um, at this point. When when I as an educator think of the word help, when I when I work with some of the teams across the university that support our students, the definition of help that I latch onto is one that respects a learner's agency and authority. Um, that all of the choices that are being made are on the part of the learner. All of the decision making, all of the ownership of the work um, belongs to, um, to the student, to the learner. Um, but students don't always have that same idea uh, of what help is. And part of that is because uh, they don't always have the same goal as we do. Um, sometimes the goal is I need to get this done. And so purchasing a paper seems like it would help on the way to that goal. Um, and so I think defining some of those ways of thinking about help and the consequences of the misunderstanding um, can, be really, can be really useful. Oftentimes students don't uh, understand some of the grayer areas of help like, uh, is it okay for me to have my sister proofread my paper? Um, well, it kind of depends. It depends on the context, but it also depends on what kind of proofreading your sister is doing. Um, I assume that the sister is not trained in giving help that respects the agency and authority of the learner, as, for example, our support staff um, are at AU. Um, most Many sisters, I'm guessing, are not trained proofreaders or trained editors or trained teachers, all the more important. Um, and so these are hard questions for students to navigate. I'm curious to hear about other um, help resources um, that you've heard about from students or seen students using. So if you wouldn't mind taking a second and just sort of sharing in the chat, um, what are some of the things that you've, that you've heard students talk about as being helpful, whether that's a generative AI tool or um, a, a sister who's a good proofreader or um, other things that you think um, you, you've heard students talk about as being helpful, just throw them in the chat. Great, so far we've got Grammarly, we've got Writing Center. Any others? A, da a dad? Yeah. Yeah, parents who have expertise in a particular area, that comes up a lot. Um, students paying for paper writing, definitely. Um, the academic integrity community uh, uses the term contract cheating for all sort of paper papers written for, you know, Writers for Hire, um, ChatGPT, students mention, oh, that's nice, Mac, um, their instructor, fellow students reading each other's papers, yeah. Great. Thanks, everybody. I think, I think that actually does a nice job of um, kind of establishing some some of the spectrum and we can we can kind of tell like looking at each example like oh that seems like help versus oh that seems like help in quotation marks um i have some flags that are raised for me when when i think about that um and so i, I want to spend a second um oh yay thanks catherine personal appointments with librarians definitely we have these sort of like um au specific um help tools um folks that we have at AU who are experts and who are trained in, in real help, right? And so that's a distinction that I often make for students when I'm when I'm talking with them about um, what real help is and what I'll encourage you at some point to do with your own students. Um, at the beginning of your, of your semester, help students figure out what useful help is. What do you expect them to do when they need help? Um, this might seem like it's not, um, like it's obvious to you, um, but the tendencies that students have sometimes to go to the parent who's an expert in the subject matter rather than the professor of the class they are in on this campus, um, it, it, it needs a sort of reiterating and reminding. Um, also students who um, don't really know or understand how our services work, this is a great opportunity to talk about them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, 
a kind of comparison between um, some of the tools that I mentioned in the session description. Um, I'll talk about why Purdue OWL specifically was something I wanted to, to get at as an example. Grammarly, um, I know many folks have heard me talk about Grammarly before, so I'll say a little bit about that and then point you to other places where I've talked about Grammarly. Um, we'll get at the sort of question in as much as it relates to this about the difference between AI and generative AI and the degree to which that distinction matters for our classroom purposes. So I assume everyone knows what the Purdue OWL is, but, but just in case you haven't seen it or used it, um, it's been around for a long time. It is from Purdue University. Um, OWL stands for on Online Writing Lab. Um, it is um, in, in the circles that I've that I've worked in, um, it's often recommended to students as primarily citation reference, but also as a reference for research and writing in general. So it will um, offer a summary of what MLA style is all about, for example, and give a kind of citation, general citation architecture for how to make a citation in MLA format. Um, and then it offers sort of how to do that for all different kinds of source types. So how to cite a video in MLA, how to cite a book in MLA. Um, and then the research and writing reference stuff um, gets at uh, what paraphrasing, summarizing, and quotation are, how they work. Um, it gives advice to students for how to do that responsibly. It gives them examples or even little quizzes on there that allow students to kind of test how um, well they're kind of uh, working with those kind of research integration strategies. Um, there's also basic guidance for sentence level and grammatical work. In general, I think when people assign students or give um, students this, this as a reference, they're saying, here's a tool you can use if you want more experience with these things. Um, I think most of the faculty I've talked to who references uh, the Purdue OWL are saying things like, I have students go read this before something is due or before they're going to practice um, a particular skill or technique. This is what the homepage looks like. Um, there's two little um, sections I'm drawing your attention to here. The first is um, on the homepage when you click on online writing lab, a little menu opens up and there are lots of different things that you can access through the OWL's website. I'm going to talk about the menu that opens up under research and citation. So when you open that menu, um, this is what comes up, research and citation resources. This is not different than what it used to be, except for one key change. Um, so the OWL's research, and gui uh, uh, like research guidance that you can see here on the left, I've noted my little arrow. I'm looking for my cursor over here. Here we go. So the OWL's research and guidance, that kind of stuff is not new. Um, the OWL has always given uh, advice on conducting research and offered resources to that end. What's new is this thing at the top where the first arrow is pointing from the right. Um, this is an embedded citation generator that is not part of OWL and it is quote, powered by citation machine. So you can see the little citation machine logo Citation Machine is another company um, that's part of Chegg. Those of you who are in math will definitely recognize um, Chegg. Maybe others of you have had experience with Chegg as a resource website for students to um, buy and exchange books. Um, there's a community of users that provides, um, in quotation marks, help to other students who are working on um, different kinds of math or science problems. Um, it, it has a, a variety of, um, of functions. Um, but Citation Machine is part of that empire. And, uh, and now it has a, a chunk of real estate on Purdue OWL's page. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about Purdue OWL in these sessions is because um, in the spring semester, I had uh, the Academic Integrity Office saw a student who said, um, when we asked them about how they accessed their sources um, and how they came to sources that didn't exist, they said, my professor recommended that I use Purdue OWL. Um, and this really surprised me because as a teacher of writing, the Purdue OWL was familiar to me. Um, my colleagues often recommend Purdue OWL. Um, in, in fact, it's recommended across the university. And so I was like, 
wait, what? How is Purdue Owl is just a reference page. It's just a place where you're getting information about uh, how citation styles work and advice and resources for integrating and conducting research using research. Um, and then I went to the Purdue Owl site and I saw and I saw this. Um, you can see now more than ever, the site is ads, ads, ads. It's like, it's just, it's a constant flow. Um, I, I, I took a screenshots of the, the Meet one and the Adobe Creative Cloud one, which the Creative Cloud one took up my whole page for a few minutes. Um, this really signaled to me that um, this wasn't the owl that I was familiar with. And it reminded me that like, wow, uh, I haven't checked, haven't checked in on the owl in a while. Um, and so I mentioned that now the OWL has this citation machine component. Um, and uh, I don't want to suggest necessarily that citation machine is bad, but I think it's worth asking. Uh, what is citation machine? Why is it on my OWL page? Um, is that OK? What is it doing? And is it bad? Um, so a citation machine is a citation generator. There's lots of other tools like it that have different brand names. So um, EasyBib is, is one that our students often talk about, um, but other citation management tools use citation generation power. So like Zotero, for example, um, is a research management software. I use Zotero um, all the time to organize and save um, and even create citations for, um, for research that I'm doing. Um, but the challenges come when, uh, in, if you've assigned, if you've given students the opportunity to use citation generators, you've probably seen citation generators are only as good as the input their users give them. So um, if you don't know the source you're looking at is uh, a newspaper, and you um, go to a citation generator and you tell the citation generator that you're reading a website, the format might look different. It might, the, the citation might be um, incorrect because the, the information you've entered about the source is incorrect. Um, this gets to the question of, uh, so it's, it, they can be bad if a student doesn't know how to use it, right? Um, they can be bad if they are using generative AI power, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, generative AI power, many of us know, um, can produce sort of hallucinations, uh, sources that don't exist, authors that don't exist, journals that don't exist, some combination of things that actually exist, but not all together. Um, and so one of the things to think about is um, with a tool that you're allowing students to use, do you know what you're really giving permission for? So if I were gonna uh, allow my students to use Purdue OWL, I definitely wanna know that this citation machine lives on that site. So then I can attend to that and the guidance I give them. So I can tell them, I don't think you should use citation machine or when you use citation machine, um, be really careful about how you're putting stuff in and make sure that you're testing what comes out. I want to pause for a second and just make this distinction between AI power and generative AI. So a lot of the stuff we do and have been doing for a really long time is uh, incorporates AI, artificial intelligence, um, things like Siri or the targeted ads. I mean, like, I guess I got that meat ad because I don't know, I eat meat. I don't know. Um, but uh, those are um often AI powered tools. AI has been in our lives for, for a long time. Um, and it's described here from this Technopedia infographic, which I thought was just a, a sort of quick way. I know there are way more nuanced definitions and I don't wanna go too deep in the rabbit hole um, on this, but um, artificial intelligence can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence, like deciding on what the source type is with the information that's provided. So if a student uses a citation generator and gives it some but not all information, the, the tool will, will produce um, a citation. Um, generative AI is creating new information or new data um, that uh, is kind of like pulling things together from stuff that already uh, from stuff that already exists or is similar to stuff that already exists. Um, so it's hard for me to say for sure which citation generators are using generative AI and which are using the same tools that they've always used. Um, 
I can't tell you for sure that, um, you know, the student I referred to uh, was was using citation machine and it generated a fake source. That's what the student told me. I'm not sure. It's one student. Um, but it does remind us that if we are sort of encouraging the use of a tool, we should know how it works and we should give students reasonable guidance about what's going on with it, how does it work, and how to use it responsibly. Um, of course, the Purdue OWL has a page on using citation generators responsibly. Um, they describe how citation generators work um, and have some language that I think does a nice job zeroing in on the important points. Writers should remember that citation generators cannot and should not do their thinking for them. Um, and I think this is actually at the heart of a lot of the advice we're giving to students about how to use AI tools, generative AI tools responsibly. These tools shouldn't be doing the thinking for you. And so that really gets at what I feel like is a song and dance on repeat for me. Um, generative AI has uh, created a lot of um, deep questions and these new tools um, are overwhelming, but oftentimes I'm coming back to stuff that I've thought and read and, and wondered for a while when it comes to academic integrity, information literacy um, and, and learning. Um, so some of these problems are kind of old to me. So on the, on the right, you can see, um, these are some real quotes from some students uh, about, about research. I'm almost done with my paper. I just need to throw in a few sources. Um, and those of you who work with student researchers um, have probably heard these things or something similar. Uh, I always write first, cite later. That one really, I mean, that's really, that one's really hard for me to read. Um, I use this tool to search for my topic. Then I took the citations it made and inserted them into my paper. Um, and so this tells us a lot. This is what's happening with some of these citation generators. It's what, what students are doing sometimes with, with generative AI tools. Um, it was already happening before generative AI was sort of in our um, ecosystem. Um, it gets at questions about reading the source, but really it gets this big question about sort of what do students think research is? Why do students think they're doing research in the first place? Um, it, there's this really transactional um, way of thinking about research that oftentimes students will come to uh, college with that I, I need five sources. So I'll just go grab these five sources, right? Um, but it takes some real um, learning and engagement with information literacy to really move their thinking beyond that, to think about research as part of inquiry, to think about research as um, part of um, what you're doing at college as a participant and a contributor to a community of knowledge. Um, and so those are challenges that we, we continue to have, I would say. Um, so my advice in thinking about some of these things that the OWL brings up, um, I think the, the OWL's situation reminds us to emphasize the importance of verification and also real engagement with sources. If a student is typing a keyword into the um, citation machine search engine um, and finding a source and then clicking cite and then throwing that in their paper, they haven't actually engaged with the source at all. Um, students I've seen aren't even opening the source. They're just taking the citation and throwing it in. The idea that a student could write a paper and then throw research in later um, really misses the boat on um, how academics, how intellectuals, how thinkers really um, use information responsibly. If you allow the use of citation generators, take time to explain how they work and how to use them responsibly um, and give students guidance about how you want them to use a tool like the OWL. Um, students often will need help uh, figuring out how to double check sources. Not all students know how to use um, some of the amazing library resources that allow them to do sort of like reverse searching. Most students know how to do the sort of like, here's a search bar, I can put something in it and find an article on a topic. Um, but if they find a citation, uh, it's another set of skills entirely to, um, to, to search for that 
um, and find it in our in our library system or or elsewhere. Um, if you want to take a minute and just sort of jot down some notes about how you might use um, some of this advice in your materials, if you want to put it in the chat or if you want to raise it um, in it out loud, that's all great. Um, my next move is to talk a little bit about um, Grammarly. So I'll pause here and say anybody who wants to shout anything out um, or take a couple minutes to write some stuff down before we move on, let's take a little pause. I say something, Allison? Yeah, jump in, Betsy. So I just, I, what I find so helpful about your comments is just the way in which we need to do so much more than just say, here's your assignment sheet, here are the rules that you have to follow. Yeah. And it's about really working with our students and saying, why, you know, what is research for? And at this point, they think research is Googling. Yeah. And so we have some challenges there. And um and I really like this idea, you know, it's about inquiry and and that they are the that that they are the generators of of their work. Mm -hmm. And what 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 thinking are they doing versus what are they, you know, the all the AI people would say, you know, co-producing or co-creating. Yeah. So yeah, some of these um, questions, I think, get it. So, I mean, I feel like you and I have talked about this a bunch, the sort of like existential questions about what it means to create or what it means to be an author um, really feel like um, some, some big stakes here. But I do think that, um, like you're saying, I think there's uh, some age old questions here. And I think um, uh, Catherine's comment earlier <laughs> strike, you know, strikes me as, as really important as uh, as um, we think about the ever increasing importance of information literacy, not just like, oh, is this a deep fake? Oh, is this image generated? Like those have consequences too, um, but also this idea that um, research is part of a creative process for students, and that um, uh, research that's informed by inquiry and curiosity is not the same as sort of throwing in a source, right? This kind of transactional, like um, any old source will do. I'll take, you know, the first five things um, in the list. Um, Marley in the chat says, um, you've been thinking about how and whether we incorporate some of this education into orientation, which could be framed in what in what is grad school? What are they doing here more than getting a degree? Totally. Um, I th these are hard conversations too, because um, it's not like there aren't other forces in our universe that tell students that this is transactional, right? Um, and, and we do recognize, you know, the real challenges students face in, um, in, in that sense. They're, they're working jobs, they're They've got internships, they have family obligations, they have um, all kinds of challenges they're balancing all at once. Um, and some of their high school experience doesn't necessarily prepare them for um, this sort of hard work. I'm thinking back, Betsy, to your student in January who said um, the, the hard stuff is kind of where it's at. Um, the, the the struggle is, is really... Um, uh, when I know I'm learning or what learning is sort of supposed to feel like. Um, okay, I'll move on to sort of talk really quickly about, oh, I'm sorry, I see Max comment too. That comment from Betsy makes me think about all of the general student-centered transparency practices that we try to promote. Yeah, definitely. Um, important for AI stuff, but important generally. I think that's right. Thanks, Mac. Um, so, um, I mentioned that I'd done some 
stuff with Grammarly and uh, presentations, uh, uh, one presentation on that during the Ann Farron workshops in the, in the winter. Um, and I will tell you that um, in preparation for that workshop, I downloaded Grammarly onto my desktop and I still can't get rid of it. Um, it's really, it's, I hate it. Um, and so uh, when you, when you download uh, Grammarly um, in its, in, in the entire, its entirety, uh, there's a little green light that sort of pops up on your desktop and it can be integrated into your email, into your Microsoft Word, into Teams, into um, everywhere you write. So it's, it's no joke. Um, Grammarly as a, as a tool has been around for a long time. I think 2009 is the year they, they began. Um, and our students um, latched onto it really quickly. So did, so did our support teams, I would say, um, in advising students that this was kind of a, a tool that would help um, identify grammatical issues in a way that spell check identifies and um, uh, potential um, errors. And uh, Grammarly would provide a kind of explanation. And it was always the user's job to make the call about whether or not a change should be made uh, or not. Um, they expanded into sort of other kinds of writing suggestions, in particular about tone. They exper experimented with that. Always it was the user's decision about um, whether to accept or reject the, the suggestion. That hasn't changed exactly. But the kinds of things Grammarly can do um, are, are, are so, so much more intense than they were. So um, I came to this these questions uh, from talking with faculty colleagues throughout the fall semester um, who are saying, have you seen that Grammarly can do this? I was telling students I could, they could use Grammarly, but I didn't really mean this. Um, so Grammarly has a, a pro component that students can pay for, but even the free version does have the capacity on some level to do more than just provide, um, more than just identify grammatical issues. It can help a student brainstorm. It can help you outline. It can shorten text. It can expand text. So like I can type in a sentence and ask it to expand that into a paragraph. I can ask it to expand that into a couple of paragraphs. Um, it can change my tone. Professional is just one option. I can choose from like a menu of tones um, that it can um, uh, provide. It sort of provides suggestions, but it gives you the text that you can um, paste into yours. So it's not just sort of like providing comment bubbles um, or identifying particular areas. Um, it's really giving you text that you can move right over. Um, it can suggest research plans. It's a, a really high powered tool. And I included on the screen, my friend, Zach, who I'm so sorry, but he's really become a kind of, um, uh, I don't know what the right term is, but I, I definitely, um, <laughs> don't don't love how Grammarly has really um, infiltrated the marketplace. I mean, every time I open YouTube, um, Zach is in my face. Um, Zach is really um, promising uh, the moon to students. Um, and yeah, thanks, Catherine. Grammarly has been accused of harvesting information from any open tab or a window. Um, and I'm not sure what the conclusion of that accusation has been been, um, but there have definitely been some questions about privacy. Um, again, something a lot of our students don't really think too much about. Um, so Grammarly has been updated with generative AI power. If you are saying something to a student like, go ahead and use Grammarly on this assignment, I want you to know what you really are allowing. Um, you, may, you may not mean what you think you mean. Um, and there's a ton of other examples that traffic kind of in the Grammarly marketplace, pro writing aid. Quillbot is a big one. Quillbot's been around for a long time, um, relatively speaking, and, and WordTune. Um, Quillbot is actually my biggest, um, <laughs> like on my biggest sort of enemy list because, um, because I think uh, students often, this is another kind of threat to information literacy learning, I think. Um, th these, these, the Quillbot, is a 
is a suite that doesn't just offer grammar suggestions, but it can paraphrase, summarize, um, it can translate, um, it can generate citations. So it's, it's kind of one-stop shopping. Um, you can uh, offer it an, an article or a section of text and it, it will paraphrase it for you. It will summar summarize it for you. Um, thanks, Bruce mentions that pro writing aid um, rephrasings are usually nonsense and not helpful. And I think that's actually makes it, uh, is, is a great way to mention that oftentimes from our perspective as professionals, as academics, as people who are absolutely thinking critically about these tools, we can figure out that they're not effective or that they're not successful or that they're not doing a very good job paraphrasing or summarizing that article or rephrasing a particular sentence. But part of what makes them problematic for our students is that our students don't always know um, when the rephrasings are nonsense or when the paraphrase is not effective or not accurate, when the summary is um, poor, when the summary is not accurate. If they don't have the skills to sort of make that distinction, um, then this is part of what makes using these tools problematic. The tools themselves, are they problematic? I'll leave that for you to decide, right? Like, I don't, this isn't about the sort of binary pro AI, anti AI, um, everybody has their own calculus for sort of risks, benefit analysis there. Um, but, but when it comes to um, what our students need to be able to use these tools or what we want from um, our materials toward our students, these are important things to think about. That our students don't always have the tools they need to think critically about the outputs they're getting. Um, so, Advice from this section um, is not that different from the first. If you're going to allow the use of a tool like Grammarly, be really specific in identifying what features are OK. So is it OK to use Grammarly to brainstorm? Is it OK to use it to expand uh, or shrink down a text? Is it OK to use Grammarly for um, rephrasing? Um, ask students to disclose the use of tools um, like Grammarly or other tools like it with details about what they used it for and how. So um, yesterday I did a presentation about citation and AI and the slides for that are up on the SharePoint too. Give some examples. Um, most major citation styles have guidance at this point for creating citations for AI, generative AI tools. Um, but probably even more useful than that uh, is um, some kind of opportunity for students to disclose more information about what tools they're using and how. So for example, a reflection memo uh, where they talk about what tools they used, how they used them, would they use them again, what was lost by using them, what was gained by using them, um, or what a lot of professional and scholarly journals are requiring of researchers who are using AI, which is uh, a more um, robust methods uh, or materials section in a piece of writing that explicitly names what tools were used, how they were used, um, for, for what purposes. Um, my advice to faculty really throughout the year has been, um, or af actually after the Grammarly presentation was, because um, I was thinking, gosh, how are we going to keep on top of all of these constantly changing tools? Um, my advice was to try to zero in on the functions or the tasks of the tools um, like brainstorming, like outlining, instead of the brand name. So um, if on an assignment you say um, you are not permitted to use generative AI tools of any kind for brainstorming, you should be doing that on your own, then we have clear guidance for the students without having to attach to a particular brand name tool whose functions might be changing all the time. So again, I'll pause here um, for note taking, thinking about sort of how you can use this advice. And again, like jump in in the chat or jump in out loud, um, what kind of insights you wanna share or um, thoughts that you think uh, we should bring to the surface um, after this. Um, my next, um, I've got like one little last chunk that kind of identifies some of the the big picture advice, and I'll point you to a couple of other tools. So that's what's coming up. Um, so take a couple of minutes, jot down some notes, jump in on the chat or jump in out loud with um, ad advice or thoughts about all this so far.
Yeah, thanks for asking. Hi, Michael. Um, there is. I'm so glad you asked. I'm going to show a slide about this, but I'll mention it now. Um, Michael says, it was suggested that faculty in our department include an AI policy in their syllabus. Is there a good resource for AU policy on this? This is great. So AU doesn't have a one-size-fits-all AI policy for syllabi. Um, so this makes it really useful to have a conversation with your colleagues in your department, people who teach similar classes to what you're teaching um, within the program, within the department, within the division, um, and in particular, uh, a conversation guided by the disciplinary or departmental values that, that you have. Um, on the resources website, let me see if I can just kind of pull it up real quick while we're here. I think this should work. Okay. Um, I just pulled up really quick the um, SharePoint page. I linked to it at the beginning of the presentation. I'll put a link in again before we go. Um, this is an academic integrity SharePoint. Um, and it's resources for faculty of all kinds. Um, but this second section here gives some guidance for the fall. So like this first document, as you can see, it's long, it's 49 pages, um, but these are pieces of it next to and below it. So if you're a department that's wanting to have some meaningful conversation to work together to come up with syllabus policy, you might start with questions to consider with colleagues, or you might look at this example of um, ways to articulate generative AI values. So this actually is a pretty common I open this, I think it should. Great. This is actually a pretty common way a lot of folks across higher ed are um, articulating some of their, their thoughts about um, generative AI. So you might have a strict or no use policy. You may have a limited or conditional policy. You may have an encouraging open policy. So this is all language you can take and use. Um, the slides actually kind of go through some details. So like if you're developing a strict or no use course policy, here are a few things to think about, um, some language that you might want to try out, some disclaimers, and the same for other types of um, policies. So everything, I think everything you need should be on this SharePoint page. If you want to have a conversation with my office, with your department, I'm happy to lead and guide those conversations or just join in however you think is useful. Um, I've done that with a couple of departments and it's been um, really awesome. Some really great conversations. It helps me know what to talk to faculty about and what the concerns are that I should be responding to. Um, but also I think it's been helpful for departments to have like some organized time to really um, talk about this together. Um, so I'll make sure to put the link um, to the SharePoint in um, again. Um, I'm gonna scroll through the chat and see what else is going on. Bruce says, consider possibility of having students submit their work prior to any use of Grammarly and then submit in a separate folder the Grammarly edited version. Consider requiring all drafts. That's really interesting. Thanks, Bruce. And Mac likes it too. Um, Mac ask, says, I asked my students to share the prompts they used in the gene tools and whatever, or in the generative AI tools, whatever it spits back out. Yeah, some tools have a system um, for like tracking that, like, um, I think it's Grammarly that allows you to, um, kind of cite itself and it'll create a whole, um, uh, mess of text that kind of shows like, what did you, like, what prompt did you use? What was the output? What prompt did you use? What was the output? Um, so you can kind of see the process. Um, Marley says, include similar guidance about AI use parameters and applications for scholarships, fellowships. Who? Yikes, Marley. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and Zoom summary. Yeah, I went to a, a webinar on AI earlier this week, and it was like 400 AI assistants were attending in the chat. Um, my office is focused on uh, the academic space, as in in the classroom for work done for credit. Um, I can, I can offer my opinion about. Um, guidelines for scholarships and fellowships um, that are that are related to, you know, AU students. Um, but I definitely haven't done a lot of research, and and maybe Gihan uh, has more insight about this about how um, em employees and um, folks who are uh, offering 
grants, scholarships, and other opportunities are thinking about the use of generative AI in application materials. Um, and yeah, it's really. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. sorry, happy to just to respond on that one, um, Allison. Uh, the short answer is we are struggling as. And they are struggling, the scholarship foundations, you know, it's uh, Truman and Rhodes and all of these are similarly. Only Rhodes has, as far as we can tell, has included some specific like rules, if you like, about using AI. And no one else seems to have, but uh, we all are kind of wondering. In fact, Paula Warwick was just asking me just yesterday like, what are we going to do about this? And should we be putting specific guidance or not? And, you know, so on. So I would very much like to just pick your brain, if nothing else, with Paula about kind of like how to think about this. And this session is very helpful for just even just the framing of, yeah. you know, how to how to kind of give students guidance when there is none and in a rapidly changing landscape i think that that's very helpful yeah yeah i'm happy to partner on that i also think this might connect to um i think margaret asked this question earlier about professional journals um that has kind of that's like referring to this um i have um also on the sharepoint site um you can see slides from previous Things. So like this is a version of the presentation that I did yesterday. And in these slides, you can see some examples of different journals um, or collections of journals. So Springer, Elsevier, um, and I can't remember the other one off the top of my head. And I think I did the same thing yesterday. <laughs> but the professional statements or the guidance that uh, scholarly journals are giving to um, researchers submitting articles for publication can be really helpful to look at, to model, especially if you're teaching, I mean, definitely if you're teaching an upper level class where you have students who are gonna begin sharing research they produce um, in scholarly and professional spaces, it makes total sense to look at sort of what the journals and professional organizations in the field are saying. Um, you may find, um, I think I was with art history, the art history department the other day, um, and they were saying, geez, uh, we have two uh, journals that we really um, look at quite a lot or, or that we're publishing in quite a lot and neither of them has made a single statement really about um, AI with enough guidance to do something with. Um, and my first thought was like, that's interesting and worth talking about with students also. Like why hasn't the journal made this statement? It tells us something about the values of this discipline, um, but also um, not just the values, but sort of how that discipline works. Um, in some really key and instructive, I think, um, ways. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, that offers some guide as well. Um, most of the journals that I've seen are saying things like in your methods or materials section, talk about how you use. Um, but I like that idea, Margaret, of, of um, maybe establishing coming up with some, some language that could be used in a student focus, you know, assignment that asks for more specific or that gives more specific guidance about like what that section could look like. Um, let's see. Betsy mentions Mark Watkins. Thanks for sharing that link, Betsy. That's useful. Um, Catherine says, it doesn't seem realistic to forbid the use of AI. I think it's better to teach the students what it is good for and what it's not. There are a number of in-class exercises that show the limitations of AI. Like Bruce mentioned, what is generated is often a garbled mess. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. I think that's I think that's right. I mean, you'll see um, in the um, the document I showed offering these this kind of tiered way of uh, approaching policy. Um, one of the things that I mentioned. Um, about a no use course policy or a strict policy um, gets to a question that came up about detection. Um, if you have a no use policy, um, then uh, you may run into a wall at some point um, about, about figuring out what's coming from AI and what's not um, generative AI tool or what's not. Um, it can be hard to tell. Um, it can be harder to tell depending on whether a student is paying for um, the most up-to-date advanced version of the tool versus using the free version of the tool. Um, 
we in the Office of Academic Integrity don't use detectors as part of um, investigations. We don't consider a detection score um, uh, evidence in those cases um, because the, the, they're wrong sometimes uh, and that's too, too much for us. Um, and uh, we know that students have lots of, there's lots of different ways to get around um, detectors. There have been some articles about detectors propensity to flag multilingual students work. Um, that that's still there's been some questions about that. I'm not sure. I don't feel comfortable drawing any conclusions about that, but there are questions about it. Um, and so when you're coming up with a sort of no use policy, these are important things to know. You may be getting stuff it is from AI, but you don't know it, or you may not have a strategy for um, for sort of what comes what comes next. Um, so I think kind of being clear about what's okay, and what's not okay, but also like Betsy highlighted um, why. Is, is really important. Um, so I think some of the features of, a, of AI powered help tools that are worth kind of noting at this point, um, it is, uh, has to do with the way generative AI um, creates new things by sort of remixing um, or, uh, or or generating based on the data it has access to um, leaves us with questions about sort of who's doing the thinking. And so I think that's actually a really helpful way of um, defining for students what's okay and what's not okay. Um, most of the time we want to see evidence of students thinking in most many of the aspects of the things that we assign. And so um, that might be a helpful um, way to frame a conversation or a design for an assignment. Um, thinking about suggestions versus decision-making. So real help, um, like I said at the beginning, kind of situates decision-making um, with the learner. The student is making, the learner is making all of the decisions um, in, in the document based on information and um, explanations of the choices that they have. Um, suggestions um, can offer that, um, but generative AI tools may be less transparent about what's suggestion versus what's not. This also gets to sort of students' confidence level, like um, Bruce's point about how these tools, um, you know, are not, are not, um, oh, sorry, I realized I moved on to a slide and I didn't toggle over, sorry. Thanks, Marley. Um, so who's doing the thinking? Um, the decision-making should be with the learner, um, but also recognizing that sometimes for students, this really taps into some um, challenges with confidence, especially when it comes to research, but really when it comes to almost anything at the university. I talk to a lot of students who are convinced that the machine is gonna produce something better than what they can do on their own. Um, I think this is also why, um, you know, longer term than this even, I think students rely on quoting things rather than paraphrasing things because they're sort of like, I could never say that, or I don't actually really understand that well enough to say it myself. Um, so I think those are some of the things to, um, to consider there. Um, can I, what's Alex, the, can I say something on that? Yeah, go ahead, Betsy. Because I totally agree with you, but I'm thinking about the 17 and 18 year olds I'm about to teach in my first year seminar. Uh -huh. And um, so uh, I'm like, and I, and I, well, I'm, I'll try to make this short. What you're presenting is the ideal. It's what I want for them. It's sure. so far from where they've come where especially with the technology we have, even before AI, where everything is cut and paste. And so it isn't even, you know, where we used to integrate stuff more on our own. So let's, can we talk about, can you give some advice on sort of how to get them from where they are to where that we want them to be without them losing hope that, you know, because I mean, I just, I had a freshman and he was a mess. He actually, he wrote a first draft and they weren't allowed to use it for their papers, but that's another story. He did, um, and he wrote, but he wrote a first draft, complete mess. He put it into ChatGPT. He got something that was slightly more intelligible. And then he went to the writing center and he worked with them. I could see that he was learning. And he got like a B on the assignment because he really demonstrated to me 
A, that he needed those tools and B, that he was learning. Mm -hmm. But like, how do we get from where we, th this ideal to where they really are? It's a real quick one, Betsy. <laughs> well, I guess I would say, I mean, so I, when I think about these questions, I'm, I don't, th I think these are big picture questions that we sort of as faculty should have in our mind as ways of kind of like framing questions for students. I think we have to be really clear about our expectations. I think we have to be really specific in the guidance that we give because students don't really have their own guardrails and can't always figure out where the guardrails are on their own. So I think the more we can like really engage on this topic with students, the more specific guidance that we can give in clarifying our expectations. And so that means being aware of um, what expectations we have that, that might be based in assumptions. Like I assume a student knows that um, if I'm giving them a test, they can't use AI. Um, is that a fair assumption? <laughs> I mean, I would err on the side of caution and be really clear about all the things that's okay for students to do when taking a test. If you can articulate that um, in uh, on the test itself, on the assignment itself, um, and go over it in class, like as many different ways as you can, um, you have a you have a better shot at it. Um, let me see if some of my advice here gets at what you're saying. Um, I think I think disclosure is also really important. I feel like in the example you described, Betsy, part of what created success for that student was um, the the open environment, the, the sort of um, feeling okay enough to disclose um, that they were using particular tools and um, and in talking about how there is like an interesting kind of metacognition that's happening um, that's not you know that that does contribute to what they're learning um, having conversations in class that are focused to the particular assignment each and every assignment because all your assignments are theoretically um, different um, but also talking specifically about what kind of help is okay to get in a particular um, circumstance in your class on this assignment and what's not. Your student knew that the writing center was a good place to go. I see students who, um, despite the fact that they are um, absolutely getting information about the wonderful resources they have, for free available to them at AU, they're still doing things like paying a tutor. Um, and sometimes that's not with the best of intentions, but oftentimes it is. And so it's kind of like, how did the student think that it was a good idea to be paying someone $200 a week to sit down and talk about their, his their history class with them when they have a professor who has office hours, they have a writing center, they have a digital research lab, they have all these different um, resources that they can take advantage of. The professor may not know that that's even a, a, a thing a student would think about. Um, and so, I think the more we can be clear about what what responsible sources of help are, the the better the better we can um, help our students kind of um, work toward the ideal. Um, and the last one, I think a lot of you have probably heard me talk about this before, and this gets at my um, what I recognize is what feels like a really impossible task, which is like learn about all the tools. And also keep up with when what their updates are like. Um, I mentioned that I feel that way. I know a lot of faculty feel that way. Um, and so for, for me, the advice I've started giving, like I said, is defining um, generative your generative AI policy based on the task or the function rather than by the brand name. So what is it okay to use AI to do? What is it not okay to use AI to do? And I'll point you to um, this video that I think, I mean, I think it's in like every single slideshow that I have now. Um, this Vox video was from uh, December. If you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. Um, students uh, get a lot out of watching it too. There's a lot of really good discussion that can come from it. But this screenshot that I have here um, kind of shows how they're breaking down some of the things that chat, they call chat, but they call chat bots, but what we've been calling generative AI can do. Um, obviously, uh, generative AI tools can do more than 
than these three things. Um, but if I were about to start teaching my class and I wanted to give clear guidance to my students, um, maybe these are three big things that I do in my class. They are. These are three big sort of focal points of my learning objectives in the class. Um, so uh, is it okay for students to use a generative AI tool to get answers to a homework question, get background info on a topic, get definitions or explanations? You know, I might go through and sort of like highlight in each assignment which ones are okay and which ones are not okay. Um, because for some assignments, it might be okay to um, use generative AI tools to get definitions or explanations or a, for a concept, but on another assignment, it might not be. Um, and so um, the departments that I've worked with have found this chart um, helpful in kind of um, connecting to their learning outcomes, either on a specific assignment or on the syllabus to kind of give guidance to students about um, how it's okay or not okay to use um, generative AI tools. Um, yeah, Betsy says um, we should tell our students when we are using AI. Um, the article from the Chronicle um, is, is linked in there. Thanks for posting that in there, Betsy. Um, yeah, we have a lot of our faculty are using generative AI tools for a variety of purposes um, to create rubrics, to um, create presentations. Wait, that's a great opportunity for me to fast forward to this, which shows you, um, and this is um, a, a cute smiling eagle with integrity. I made this on Canva, uh, Canva's um, magic image generator. It took a really, oh no, you're not seeing the slides, Michael. Are others having trouble seeing the slides? I can see them. Okay. Um, my, it took me a while to generate this, this eagle. Uh, I didn't really realize that most images of eagles are really menacing. Um, so I had to ask it many different ways to make the eagle cute and friendly and um, jo joyful in some way. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, if we're using generative AI tools, um, we should absolutely disclose those to students. Um, I'll point out again uh, that we have a SharePoint. This is the tiny URL for it. Um, tinyurl.com backslash AIC resources. You can always email um, my team, academic integrity at american.edu, or you can email me directly, a thomas at american.edu. And this is just a screenshot of the stuff that I toggled over to um, before. Uh, the top left is the full and complete fall guidance for AI and academic integrity. There's a whole lot of stuff in there. Um, I broke it apart into these other five sections so that um, if you want to just kind of zero in on the thing that's most interesting to you uh, in the moment, um, you can access it quickly without um, running through a million pages. So um, if you and if you are looking through that and you're sort of like, I'd really like to see something else or can you address this um, or that looks funny, um, please send me an email. Let me know. Um, give give us some feedback and advice about what you think would be most um, useful. And I think we have about ten minutes, so um, there's a there's a survey, but also we can talk chat a little bit more, talk about any questions um, that are that are lingering. Oh, Mac, thanks for putting that link in the chat. I'm going to stop sharing so that if we want to um, have a bit of a conversation, we can do that. I'm just gonna put up the QR code on screen share while you guys are talking. Thanks, Navila. Anyone wanna jump in with any thoughts, questions, um, ways you think you might make use of some of this? Here's, you know me, I'll jump in. Um, <laughs> what it really is just a reminder to me, uh, and I, I faced this when I tried to work with it last year, to really 
do this properly, it takes time with our students. Yes. And I think that it is important at this point in terms of teaching our students, this is a major learning curve that's happening right now. And so I think I just need to let go of a couple of articles or topics in my courses and spend the time on AI. And I don't know how I'm going to do that because <laughs> everything mm -hmm. I've got there is perfect. No. Yeah, I think that's right. I feel like students are finding that too. I mean, uh, I've heard from a lot of students who are learning about generative AI that like, oh, I feel like this should be easier than it is. And it's like, nope, using these tools for you at the place you are at right now is actually more difficult because you're not just learning the skill or the content, you're also learning to um, apply the critical thinking skills and the contextual clues. And all of these different things have to sort of come together. It's a lot more cognitive work um, for students to navigate this too. And so I feel like, um, that's a big part, like telling students, like in some ways, like using generative AI tools for academic purposes should kind of feel a little more difficult. Like it shouldn't, if it's making it easier for you, then it might not be appropriate. You might want to ask about it. And the alternative, the other side of the equation, which is to have asked the students not to use AI requires more touch points uh, focusing more on the process and not just on the outcome, which also takes more time. Yes. Yes, it absolutely does. And I think I've heard from a lot of faculty this summer who are sort of turning their assignments upside down to include more um, contact. So more, more conversations or presentation opportunities, um, uh, drafting or other kinds, other ways of sort of scaffolding. We've talked about um, putting something in a syllabus or an assignment that lets a student know that they may be expected to discuss their work or their, their process. All of these things take an enormous amount of time. Um, and I wish I had a better, I don't have, <laughs> I don't have an answer or strategy for that, but I think you're, I think you're right. Um, I see Shireen asked, what's the most recent AI, which is free and most comprehensive? That's a hard question too. Um, AU has um, access through our Microsoft subscription package to Microsoft Copilot. Um, it works on the desktop. And I think there are some um, tutorials or information on this CTRL site. We've had a, there've been a couple of presentations that folks have done um, sort of tutorials about how to use um, co-pilot. Um, so that's free for us at AU. Um, that's the only uh, generative AI product that is freely accessible through, through AU. Um, a number of AI generative AI tools are um, changing some of their subscription models. So um, it was true that like for the basic model, it's free and for the, um, the advanced model, you had to pay a subscription fee. And now what a lot of them are doing is changing to, you can use the most advanced model, but only three times a day, or you can use the most advanced model, but only for um, one uh, project or something like that. Um, and so the subscription models, I I, th I think that's how they're going, but I'm not an expert in, in that. It's just kind of what I've seen. So that may change some of our thinking about equity. You know, um, equity has been a big question uh, when it comes to student access to generative AI tools. I can definitely tell um, that, uh, you know, when I see questions about whether something has been generated by AI, like you can, um, the, the earlier versions of ChatGPT are, um, are more, I forgot the word Bruce used earlier, um, but are, are not very good. Um, whereas the later models are, are better. Um, there's also a lot of questions about sort of like, can they continue, you know, can they continue to improve? And we'll see a lot of changes on that front as well. So we'll kind of try to keep up with some of those, <laughs> some of those technology questions so that we can offer some good advice. Um, about about that. I've heard people say Gemini and Claude are much better than ChatGPT. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I I can't speak to better. I, I, I think the differences between them have become uh, more pronounced and there are more people talking about the differences. And actually, um, I think I brought up, I'm not sure if I, it was earlier today or yesterday or all the days are blurring together for me, but um, uh, Ezra Klein's podcast interview with Ethan Mollick, who is many of you probably heard me talk about before. Um, Malik is a, a business school professor at uh, Wharton who's written a bunch about AI and um, they talk about, and as Recline is the host, he kind of like uses Claude and you can kind of see, um, they point out some of the differences in those tools. Malik in his book and on his blog um, does some comparison work. I'm not sure. I think he has something about Gemini now, but I'm not sure before it was uh, comparing Claude and chat GPT, but yeah, all these tools are, um, they're not, they're not all the same. Uh, and that's also hard to keep up with in terms of, um, like why you might choose to use one over another as a user. Oh, thanks, Mac. Yeah, that's uh, Ethan Malik's Substack. Um, if if anyone wants to uh, invite him to AU, I'd be interested in hearing him speak. <laughs> Second that. <laughs> Kogod. <laughs> yeah, who's got money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll just um, I'll I'll end with uh, thanking you all for coming and spending your time thinking about this, especially as the semester is about to start. I know it's a super busy time, and um, and also like clinging to the end of vacation -y time. So I do uh, appreciate the chance to talk with you all. Please, um, if anything comes up that's related to academic integrity, if you get into a class situation where you've got a concern let us know. Um, my email is in the chat. You can always get in touch if you want to see more stuff on the SharePoint, if you have ideas or contributions. Um, I'd love to um, make use of it. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>